Anytime an automaker makes significant changes to a vehicle, especially one like this with such a lengthy history, it's going to cause controversy. This is a 2022 Land Rover Defender 110. And yes, there is some controversy when it comes to this vehicle because the Defenders up until this generation had all been body on frame SUVs. And really they were the first Land Rovers ever made. It wasn't until the 1980s that the name Defender was applied to this vehicle when the Discovery came out. Up until then, a Land Rover was a Land Rover. There really weren't any differences between that and say the Range Rover. But that is the focal point of the controversy when it comes to this vehicle because with this new generation Land Rover Defender, they've gone from using a body on frame setup and has a monocoque shell or more commonly known as a unibody setup. Which is some of the reasons why people are kind of up in arms when it comes to this generation Defender because even though it is still a superbly capable off-roader, because that fundamental change to how the platform is designed and built, it's made people a little upset. Now it came to the original Land Rover 110 and 90, it represented essentially the wheelbase for those SUVs, the 90 being about 92 inches, but the 110 being 110 inches. But when you compare today's generation, there is about a 17 inch difference in the wheelbases, but they don't line up with the 90 and 110 anymore. It's just a way to distinguish the two door and the four door. But the Defender only shares the name from the previous generation. There really isn't anything that is carried over from the previous Defender. This is completely all new. And it uses pretty much the same platform that Land Rover is currently using, their D7 platform, but it is a D7X for extreme, because this really is meant to be the most extreme version of a Land Rover produced to date. Now, depending on which market you're in, you'll have access to different engines. This one here is the P400. It's a three liter inline six mild hybrid electric vehicle. It has 395 horsepower, 406 pound feet of torque, and uses an eight speed automatic transmission with four wheel drive. Now that's important because the mild hybrid kind of helps to offset some of the jitteriness that you would get from a stop and go system that we find on pretty much every car to date. However, the Land Rover Defender can come as a V8 and a plug-in hybrid, again, depending on which market you're in. But our X-Dynamic SE here is the P400. So far, it's been working out very well. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I think this Defender looks fantastic. It's aggressive, it's boxy, it's large, it is in command when you're on the road. And I have had tons of interest as I've been driving along with this vehicle this week. Now, if you do watch our show regularly, you'll know that during the time I had this, I also was driving the 2014 Range Rover Sport. And while I said I preferred driving the Range Rover Sport, which is true, the comfort was better, the space was better, the overall performance and ride was better, I have been enjoying this only because people haven't seen this before. And it's strange, yeah, I really haven't seen any either, except for the day that I picked it up, there was another Land Rover Defender 110 on the road with me, and it wasn't a press vehicle, so I've seen one out in the road. But they are gonna become popular because they aren't overly expensive. If you think about how this fits into the marketplace, there isn't really any direct competitors with this. Okay, you could argue that the Jeep Wrangler is a competitor. Yeah, it's kind of a boxy SUV, it's off-roader, but the pricing, not quite there. But even if you went through the entire Mopar parts catalog, you'll never get up to $91,000. You compare it to something like the new Ford Bronco, which is actually something I was going to compare this to, but because there are so few available right now due to the global pandemic, I just wasn't able to line the two up. Again, it's gonna be difficult for you to get that price up to 91,000. But then what about the Mercedes G-Wagon? It's boxy, it's an off-roader, it's luxury oriented, but those start at pretty much double the price of this. So that doesn't compete with it either. So the Defender itself is kind of in this weird position where it's affordable for what you're getting out of it, not overly expensive, but whether or not it will sell is going to be the question because yeah, the on-road mannerisms for this are really good, but 
is this really a market for people who want to buy a $91,000 brand new Defender? Because you could buy a 2003 Defender for $80,000 Canadian. The prices for those have not gone down at all. So you could buy a new one for just a little bit more. So it's a very interesting vehicle, very unique market for this. We'll see how time tells when it comes to this. But I want to talk about the exterior design of this. Personally, I really do like it. Very boxy. The front end with the daytime running lights and turn signals looked almost like a transformer. Very robotic, very cyberpunk 2077. I like the front end of it. Side profile is really good. Personally, I would prefer this 110 over the 90. I am a four door kind of guy because I have a family. It's easier to get into the back. So I just like the overall length of this. I like the look of it. Back end great as well with the spare tire on the back and just how flat it ultimately is. Plus the taillights are so unique on the back as well. I just think it has a very good design to it. Okay, so you've got some trim on the hood that looks like you could stand on it, but you can't. If you put any weight on it, it will break. And for the most part, some of the trim on the outside is functional, but is it really necessary? I don't know. I just think it looks really good. Plus the side panels at the sort of C pillar area, you can put storage items on there. They are sort of accessory points to protect the trim, protect the glass. If you are getting some authorized accessories to put on the outside of your Defender. Now the interior is where things get very interesting for the Defender because it is so different from any other vehicle that we've tested. It's very similar as well to what we've seen on the new Bronco. Again, I haven't had a chance to feature it, but my local dealership did have one and I had a chance to look on the inside. And I do see that there are some similarities with how both of these vehicles have been designed. The idea of the inside on this is to be weather resistant. So if you are doing off-roading, you are more of an outdoors adventure person, you won't have to worry as much about the interior of the vehicle. The first thing you'll notice when it comes to the inside of the Defender is the exposed power-coated magnesium cross car beam. It's integral to the structural integrity of the vehicle and it runs across the dashboard area. It's recessed into it and you can also see the same type of material used on the steering wheel. There's different color options for it and I just think it looks great. It feels solid. It looks fantastic and it's a really great detail that distinguishes this from any other vehicle on the market. There are built-in grab handles to make getting in and out easier, especially if you're doing some off-roading. And then on the inside are storage areas. So you can put change, items, whatever it may be. There are some little storage cubbies built into it. The material around it is also very unique. It uses Robus Tech. It's a protective material that is designed for extreme outdoor use. It wraps all the way around the top of this, as well as the door cards and the center console area, giving you better wear and tear protection, especially if you are doing some off-roading with this. It feels a lot like a very high-end rain jacket with some nice soft touch material to it, but you can tell that it will be very water resistant and very mud and dirt resistant as well. And that's something else that you'll notice too with the Defender. We do have the interior protection package, gives us the rubberized floor mats as well as the one on the trunk. But if you remove them, it's still a rubberized floor. There is no carpeting on here. So again, if you needed to maybe hose out the vehicle, it is more water resistant than you would find on other vehicles, especially other Land Rovers. Our test model here is set up with five passenger seating, so two in the front, three in the second row. However, you do have a number of options depending on how you want to configure it. You could have a jump seat in the middle here, so you could have a six passenger setup. You would remove this center console and have a foldable seat, similar to what we see on big pickup trucks. So that's an option for you there. Plus there is the option for the five plus two setup, which would be two jump seats in the trunk area to have essentially three rows of passenger space. So depending on how you want to configure your vehicle, there are some options out there. Again, ours is a five passenger setup and it works well for me. Overall seat comfort is great. Visibility is pretty good out of this. Yeah, the A pillars are a little big, but they have been designed in a way that minimizes the amount of blind spot that you'll get from it. But overall the interior works very, very well. Now there's some very important and unique camera technology that comes on this vehicle. Jaguar Land Rover calls it clear sight ground view, and it allows you to see essentially underneath your vehicle, which is pretty cool stuff. 
There's six cameras, 12 ultrasonic sensors, and four radar sensors on the exterior of this vehicle. And together, they're able to map out what's essentially underneath your truck. So when you're driving forward, the front camera is showing you what's going on there, but it's also recording the images as well and using the speed of the vehicle, the direction of the steering wheel and other sensor data to essentially show you what you would have passed over without actually having a camera underneath the vehicle. It does the same thing for backing up as well. Now I've tested it and I have to say, it truly blew my mind the first time I saw it because the infotainment system is using a Snapdragon processor. It is able to produce this video quality on the fly with minimum lag. I mean, unless you're going too fast or there's too much kind of underneath the vehicle for it to truly extrapolate, I have found that it works well. So if you're pulling into a parking spot, you'll be able to see the markings if you've gone over the lines. And if you were to use the actual ground view setup, which is for off-roading, it'll remove essentially the hood area. So you can see underneath the wheels, if you're going up rocks or anything that is a little bit more dangerous than what you would be normally doing while you're off-roading, you can see better. And it does tell you there that it is not necessarily live footage. So keep that in mind. If somebody yeah, decides to jump underneath the vehicle while you're driving, the cameras won't necessarily see it. So keep that in mind, but still, first time we've experienced that technology before and it works very well. We also have the clear sight rear view frameless mirror. It also has built-in home link. Now the camera is located on the shark fin on the roof, I find it is just a little too high. The idea is it's meant to replicate what you would be seeing normally out of the rear view mirror, but it could have been a good opportunity for JLR to have it produce sort of better imaging because I do find, especially with smaller vehicles that are behind me, I cannot see them at all. When I turn off the camera, I can sort of see them a little bit, depending on how they have parked or pulled up behind me. So it could have been a good opportunity to just put the camera on the back and instead of having a direct you know, sort of view of what you would normally see to give us a better view of what we should be able to see. But the option is there, you can turn it on or off. I have found that it works out pretty well. As I mentioned, the infotainment system on this is really good. We're using a 10 inch PIVI Pro infotainment system, which again uses that Snapdragon processor and using QNX as the operating system with a 1920 by 720 pixel resolution. It has built-in battery backup for instant on. So if you've parked the vehicle, that battery is always keeping the system running just like your phone or your tablet. So when you turn the vehicle on, it's instantly on. There's no lag, no delay when it comes to turning it on. And we've talked about that when it comes to some luxury manufacturers. So this one works great. I think the user interface is beautiful. It's just seamless, integrates very well with the overall idea of what this vehicle is. And I really do like it. Very powerful stuff there. We also have a fully digital gauge cluster in the driver's area. You have options to be able to customize that the way that you want with your map, media information, bunch of stuff there. And there's an optional head up display. Our vehicle does not have that. Couple other features and tech bits to note. We have heated and ventilated front seats, heated outboard rear seats, tri-zone automatic climate control, the panoramic sunroof with skylights in the back. That's very nice to have. A Meridian audio system, weight sensing. So if you do take this vehicle into some light water, you have that as well as the vehicle dimensions. That's something that we don't usually see either. Not only will it show you the important vehicle dimensions of this, but depending on which drive mode and which overall height you're in because this uses an air suspension you can see the difference in dimensions both in metric and imperial so all the information is in the infotainment system very powerful stuff if you're doing off-roading you will find it immensely useful and if you're not it's still really cool to have Final thing to note, we have three memory options for the 14-way power seats on the front, and all four doors have a safe exit system. There's a little light and a panel on the doors, so when you're parking somewhere, it will detect if there's a vehicle coming on either side. So if you go to open the door, it will warn you that there is a vehicle coming or some sort of obstacle to prevent any accidents. So some cool stuff there. We do see that from some manufacturers. This one has been implemented in a really nice way. That's essentially it for the interior, the exterior, and everything else you need to know about the vehicle itself without driving it. Now it's time to take it on the road and see how the Land Rover Defender does as an on-road vehicle. Because as much as I would like to take it off-road, let's be honest, this is going to be spending most of its time on-road. So let's see how it does. Is there a better name for an SUV than Defender? Not really, I don't think so. I think it's probably one of the best names. So strong, I mean, Defender. You're off to go do some defending. Really is just the perfect name for this SUV. 
Now, how does it do on our test loop? We completed our 100 kilometer independent test loop in 10.4 liters per 100 kilometers. Oof, that's quite a bit. Now, this is a heavy vehicle. It's a big vehicle. It's not overly aerodynamic, so it makes sense. The mild hybrid electric vehicle system on this, it functions. Yeah, I don't have any issues when it comes to the auto stop start system. It doesn't even really do anything. So that itself has worked out very well. But yeah, fuel economy wise, not super great. And because there really isn't anything else to compare it to, I don't know how that compares to anything else. You know, we haven't driven the Bronco. We haven't driven the Mercedes G Wagon. So we're just going to say that 10.4 is the number that we got. And you can figure out how that factors into your life if you're in the market for it. But I mean, it's functional, right? It works, gets the job done. So there's the fuel economy. Let's talk about the rest of the Defender experience because I have been enjoying myself. And I was trying to think back to which vehicle I had recently that I was getting so much attention with. And I, honestly, for the life of me, I just can't remember now. But this one is getting a lot of attention because it's unique, you know. You might not necessarily know what a Defender is. You might not even know that this is a Defender if it passes by. But because it looks so different from anything else on the market, because it has this big, boxy, rugged, masculine, defined look to it, people are checking it out. And that's what I really do like about it. So I, I just forget the, what the car was that I had, but this one has been getting a lot of attention. I do like that, but I do like the drive of this. I do like the ride. It's smooth on the road. The Range Rover Sport that we had was a little bit smoother, but you know, obviously this one is more designed for off-roading and that makes sense, but I have enjoyed my time with it so far. You know, it's comfortable, it's quiet. The inside here is really quiet. You know, there's a lot of soft touch materials in here to help eat up some of the road noise. So for the most part, everything has worked out really well. I am very satisfied with this. And because there are some off-road modes, if you really are doing some off-roading, you're gonna have a much better experience with this than a lot of other off-roaders because there are so many choices. The infotainment area here, the controls for your HVAC and some of the drive modes, very simple to figure out. You actually push a button to activate the knob that you would normally use for your temperature, and you can go into many different modes. There's a configurable mode, you know, your own system, there's a wade mode, rock, crawl, sand, mud and ruts, gravel, snow, and grass, and then the comfort as well as eco mode. Now we did our test loop in eco mode. I've kept it in comfort the rest of the time because it's just how the car starts up. There isn't necessarily a sport mode. The transmission has a sport profile. You just tap it over into essentially flappy paddle mode, despite there's no flappy paddles, but you do have the sport mode through there, but you don't really need it. I mean, this vehicle performs well enough in normal mode regardless if you do need a little bit of extra you know maybe you just want the transmission to shift a little bit later you're passing somebody that's pretty much the only time i use sport mode but the option is there should you need it but the rest of the drive and ride is really really good on this i just wish i could do some off-roading for you to tell you how it is in that aspect but again i think most people are going to be buying this to use on road but with the capabilities of having something that you could take off-road a little bit more rugged than your typical you know crossover or even some of the suvs out there all right we'll do a little zero to 100 test here just to give you an idea oh yeah there you go buddy and 100. That's not overly quick, don't get me wrong. It's not meant to be a performance vehicle. If you want that, go with the V8, but the pickup on it is pretty good. The sound, not so bad either, especially from an inline six, a mild hybrid one at that. So I think you're gonna be pretty happy if you're going for this one. The fact that they offer a plug-in though, that's probably the one that I would go with. Wish that we had that option here, but regardless, it works really well the way that it is. Plus the transmission shifts smoothly. I love the ZF eight-speed transmissions. Some of the best transmissions, if not the best transmission on the market right now. So I do like that. And everything else about it has worked out pretty well. As I mentioned when we were doing the walk around, I mean, there's so much technology on this SUV. It all works so well. I mean, I'm very impressed with the infotainment system on this and just everything comes together in a way that makes sense. It's luxurious, but you also feel that, especially with this, you know, if you do take it off-roading, it can take a punch. It's a little bit more rugged than your typical luxury SUV. So if you want something that you don't feel as bad 
going into some rougher terrain, this is the one to do it with. And I have enjoyed my time with it. I mean, everything is what I want. I think the only thing I would have added to this, for me personally, is the head-up display. That's the one thing that I would have added on this, but for the rest of it, I'm super content with the way that this vehicle is configured. And I think you will be too. And the fact is, you know, I've always known that the older Defenders were very expensive. Did it surprise me that the 2003 that's for sale, it's a red one, I believe it's a four door for $80,000 Canadian. I mean, that is, that's insane, $80,000. So you can get, yeah, uh, a lot of Land Rover for a lot of money, which is crazy because I would personally take the new one, right? You're spending, yeah, you're spending about $10,000 more, but you're getting so much more tech, plus a warranty, which is really important, and you have something that is unique. Now, I'm not saying that for $80,000 for a 2003 isn't worth it, but I mean, you're getting a different experience. And that's the problem with these high-end off-road SUVs, this and the Mercedes G-Wagon. The prices really don't depreciate. They, they keep their value better than pretty much any other luxury vehicles out there. So if you're buying this, I don't know. I don't think that this will hold on to its value as well as the previous generation does and has. But you're also not quite buying this for that reason. Here's the best way that I can explain it to you. Back in 2016, when the Land Rover Defender went out of production, that was the end of the Land Rover Defender, okay? This vehicle, yes, it shares the same name, but it's not necessarily the same vehicle. So it's sort of like getting a rebirth, but not having the same thing. It is sort of a continuation, but not really. I don't think that really makes any sense, but for the people that were hating on this because it's not body on frame, because it isn't really a true Land Rover Defender, it's not going to be. Because in the future, none of these vehicles are gonna exist anyway. And we've talked about that before with some of the other vehicles like the Ford Mustang Mach-E. We're in a transition period. The auto industry is changing. We are moving away from the traditional gas diesel engines that we've had for a hundred years everything is going electric. That also means that the vehicles have to change too. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have a body on frame electric SUV, but it is cheaper to produce vehicles that are unibody. That's the reality of it. And these vehicles are only gonna to continue to go up in price. So unless you want them to cost $200,000 like a G-Wagon, you have to change your mindset on it. And that's what Land Rover's done with this. And they've reimagined what the Defender can be. They ended the Defender's first generation production. That's over. If you want the body on frame, go spend $80,000. This is the new Land Rover Defender. And I have to say, I am thoroughly impressed with it.